Yeah. So I want to start with a testimony. Wow. Wow. So it was 69 years ago. A man in Dallas was studying the growth where people were moving in the, in the state of Texas. And his job was to plant churches, to help plant churches. And he was looking all over the map, looking where people were moving to. And this university was, ex was beginning to explode. And he noticed that people were moving Probably because of the base and the, and the university, I don't know why. I never really looked too far into why. But he saw that people were coming to Kingsville, Texas. And then he looked at the amount of churches in Kingsville at the time, and he said, there's not enough. And there is no church on the northwest side of town. And there needs to be one right by the university. And so then he went to First Baptist Church, Kingsville. And he said, here's $2,000 to get you started buy some land and build a church. And they did. And 67 years ago on this day, the doors opened. And that's a really special thing. And so, you know, yeah, we're dressed up. But I'm going to tell you why we're dressed up. We're dressed up today not because we're wearing costumes. But we're remembering what the Lord started here. And we're remembering a time when every person that walked into this building, it didn't matter what circumstances they were in. It didn't matter what people said to them. It didn't matter how much money they had or didn't have. It didn't matter what color their skin was. None of that mattered. What The people, when they walked into this place, they had hope that God was about to do something. And so, yes, we're dressed up, but we're dressed up to remember what that day was like. I don't want you thinking you're wearing a costume. You're remembering what people were hopeful for. So whatever outfit you chose was to help you identify with a group of people that when they walked into this building, on July 18th, 1954, what's that? With no AC, open windows. The windows didn't look like this. They were the old, you know, crank the windows open. Yeah. We wouldn't go look at the Fellowship Hall. We got a picture of opening day, July 18th, 1954. Group of people standing out front. No trees yet. The trees were planted in the 80s. The two oak trees out there, they, those weren't there. And just 75 people in their little outfits. All they're going, God's about to do something. And we're a part of something amazing. And how have we forgotten that? How is it that we, and I'm asking a, a tough question here. I'm just saying, isn't it wild that we have gotten so caught up in our life and what's going on in our life that we've forgotten that God's trying to do something in Kingsville, Texas. And he has chosen this church to do something great here. And what First Baptist Church wrote about this church was that this church would be the greatest mission in the history of South Texas. That was their hope. They were sending 60 people, 70, 75, 73, 76, whatever. I've counted 76 in the picture. Official records say there were 73 there. But you can't see everybody anyway, so who knows, right? But those people, First Baptist sent 60 of their members over here and said, you are no longer members of our church. You're going to start your own here, and you're going to do amazing things because God wants to do something with missions in this part of town. He wants to reach people that nobody else can reach. He wants to reach a group of people on campus that people can't reach and a group of socioeconomic situation that most people can't reach and maybe a language barrier that others can't reach and generations and countries and nationalities that, people can, that other churches won't be able to reach. Something is supposed to be here to reach people that others don't. 
And it's a beautiful thing. I am so filled with joy right now because we're still at the beginning. We're not celebrating the, the wrapping up of an era. We're not, we're not celebrating the good old days, wishing it was like that. No, we're saying today is the day of salvation, and the Lord wants to do something. And we want to be a part of it. We don't want to be a part of a church that just wants to come and hear a word and sing a couple of songs and feel good about themselves. You know, that's a benefit of this, but that's not the reason we're here. Amen? We're here because we want to touch God. We want to taste God. We want to see God. And we want to watch him move. And you have breath for that same reason. Your breath. How many of you know that your breath isn't yours, it's his? You can't breathe without him breathing it into you. What if, what if your desire, I'm going to ask you all to do something. I don't care how long you do it, but would you hold your breath? Just, just take a breath and hold it for as long as you can. Maybe three seconds, 20 seconds, I don't care. Just hold it. What if that desire to breathe again is actually the Lord's desire to breathe into you. What if it's not your, your body trying to stay alive, but it's your spirit in partnership with God, and God's trying to do something in you? And he's the one putting that desire to breathe in you, saying, no, you need another breath because I need you to breathe. What if our perspective changed from survival to living? What if we quit trying to worry about how to manage my circumstances so that I look okay and actually live as if the God of the universe lived in you? Could you be so bold? Awesome. See, I didn't ask you to take a breath because it was a good thing. It was so that you could feel the desire of God to live in you. So hopefully you did it even for a few seconds and you felt the tug and you realized that's God and not you. Talk about a testimony. This church, you, us, we, we are an amazing group of people that are filled by God and know God and he knows us. Us. He knows each one of us, and he can't wait to live through you, to be his conduit. Some of you may not know what that means. Electricity runs through a cable because it's a conduit, and electricity is the, like the highway, right? The conduit's the highway that the electricity can go through. What if you would actually live as a conduit of the Holy Spirit? Being his avenue to which he reaches people. In Sunday school, we were reading from Revelation chapter 3. Studying the church of Sardis. And he says, you guys have a great reputation. Solid work. But I know the truth. Your work is not complete. Some of you are clean, but not everybody is clean. And your, your work is unfulfilled is the actual Greek word. We were looking at it in Sunday school. I was blown away. I was almost late getting here because I was like, the word is alive and it was teaching me. And that's why like Sunday nights, what we're going to be doing in August is going to be removing your fear, removing the excuses that keep you from living fully for God. Teaching you how to do it, teaching you things that you're not comfortable with so that you will no longer be uncomfortable with it. Removing the excuse, and I dare you to show up. Because this city won't change unless you do. And what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing every day and expecting a different result? How long have we been praying for revival? We're doing the same thing every day. Lord, you promised. He's like, yeah, I know what I said. I'm still waiting. 
we're insane. If we think that our prayers are enough, if they haven't been, well, we're just waiting for a bowl to be filled. Now, don't twist the scripture to make yourself feel good. You know, when I get up here, despite how much I want to, I am not your friend. I was telling our class yesterday, I've been asking the Lord how to describe what happens when I preach. Because, you know, I was a pastor before I got completely wrecked by God. Wrecked my, not destroyed wrecked, but reconciled, like to short it, shorten it to wreck. I got reconciled by God fully. And it takes one moment. It takes one moment for, for listen to me. It takes one moment. I'm not trying to speak down to anybody, but I need to make this clear. It takes one moment for you to encounter the God of the universe that actually transforms you. How many of you struggle with the fact that you're not transformed? Still struggle with things. Oh, man. St see, that means you're not born again. You raised your hand. Some of you were too ashamed or too afraid to raise your hand. You're not born again. Because what the word says is that one moment with the Lord and you're never the same. Let me, let me explain it to you. Jesus, because I, I want to be really clear. John chapter 4. Here we go. That's where I was supposed to go. That was my bookmark for where I thought we were going. John chapter 4 verse 13. Yeah, threw the bookmark out. Jesus answered, whoever drinks from this water shall thirst again. Verse 14, but whoever drinks the water that I give will never thirst again. Did you see the transformation that happened from one sip of the Lord? Complete and total transformation, completely free from everything. Learning how to do that, meaning learning how he sets us free, and then we go, okay, how do I get, how do I, that's my habit. But he set me here. Because he says it takes, us, it takes us out of the pit and sets us on the rock. And then we look over at the pit and go, but that's what I know. And then we go back into it. Were you born again? No. Born again is different than being saved. Born again is the requirement for heaven. I'm here to make you work out your salvation with fear and trembling, not to make you feel comfortable. I'm here to make you question your salvation so that you go into your secret place and you find out from the Lord. Because when you seek his face, guess what you find? You find his face. And when you see him face to face, what happens to you? You die. It was the first revelation I ever got. And, and I'm talking about from the face to face encounter. Which to me, I was a pastor here hired May 4th of 2014, 2014, May 4th, 2014, my first Sunday here. I've been pastoring at two different churches helping, doing interim pastoring, two different churches before I came here. And then one year here, and then April 7th of 2015, I encountered him face to face. And I realized that I had never known him and that I was lost because I knew about him, but I denied his power. I denied his glory and I denied everything good about him. And I preached his law instead of him. And I preached obedience instead of love. And so it changed my life. When are we going to understand that Matthew 7 is people doing all the works of God but not knowing him. The gifts and the calling come without the repentance. Without repentance, I go back into the hole. But with repentance, I'm born again. I'm new. And Paul writes over and over, remember what the Lord did 
so that your repentance can be complete. Peter writes it a slightly different, right? Because he says, if you think you've lost these things, if you think you don't have them, it's because you forgot that the cross completed its work, that your sins are forgiven, right? That's actually what it says, is that your sins have been forgiven. To me, it's kind of the same phrase, right? But it's the, the cross finished its work. How many of us taste the Lord, see that he's good, but then we get thirsty again? See, I haven't been thirsty in six years. I have to be honest. That's not bragging. Please understand that's not bragging. But for me to deny that would be pride. It would be, it would be to deny what God has done in my life. I have not been thirsty in six plus years. I have not had a day where circumstances outweighed the grace of God. I've had not had a day where worry outweighed the love of God. Where what somebody said or did or what bill I got to pay or whatever, whatever it is. Where they don't matter. The only thing that matters is God. See, when you see him face to face, perspective changes. But how do you see him? How do you get face to face with the Lord? That's so hard to do. Because our church doesn't know how to, and I mean Western church, Christianity. I let me say it this way. Jesus didn't create Christianity, did he? Was he trying to start a new religion? No, he was actually trying to remove religion. Amen? Okay, so Christianity is the religion that man tried to form to follow Christ instead of to be like him. If anyone is to follow Christ, he must learn to walk as Jesus walked and live as Jesus lived and love as Jesus loved. The love of Christ compels us. I'm quoting scriptures just bam, 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 fast. I got two. So let me explain what sermons are like because I never even got to that, right? So, so for a lot of you, you don't, maybe some of you don't know what tongues actually is like. But when, when, when I speak in tongues, my brain asks a million questions. When tongues comes out of my mouth, my soul is what the Bible calls unfruitful. So my mind is literally saying, Jeff, you should probably say this or that or this isn't real. It's doing everything it can to talk me out of speaking. Why? Because it's my spirit speaking. Now, let me also be very clear that tongues can be done in the soul as well, where your mind is actually telling your mouth what to do. And that's not spiritual. And so that's why we don't teach tongues, because to teach tongues is to teach you the solical version of it and not the spiritual version of it. Soul is demonic. Spirit is of God. When God tells you to speak and you just allow your mouth to go and you don't know what's going on and your mind is freaking out versus your mind still telling your mouth what to say. Two totally different experiences between spirit and soul. Tongues. Okay, so when I preach, a lot of times I'm thinking and I'm processing and my brain is filtering and telling my mouth what to do. But every once in a while, like today and last Sunday especially, was awesome. I can't, my brain is actually the whole time saying, where are you getting this information? This is literally what goes on while I preach. My brain is going, where did you get that information? I've never read that. You don't need to, you need to stop saying this stuff. It could be a lie. How dare you take a risk like this? What if you say something wrong while my mouth and my spirit are crying out truth? It's amazing experience. And it's the same thing with prophecy. When you speak prophecy and it's from the Lord, your mind is like, what are you doing? How do you know this? This is impossible. You just need to stop and apologize and walk away. And yet your spirit just knows. What we're trying to teach you is that when you, this church, what we're trying to do is get you outside of religion, get outside of the soul, which is all we've been trained in, because from the moment we're born, let's break this down a little bit. 
This is now my mind processing what my mouth just said. From the moment that we're born, we are raised in the soul. You want what you want, right? It's inherent. Why? Because we were made in the image of love. Love is completely selfless. But when sin entered the world, humanity became void of love and needs a relationship with God in order to get that love. Again, now my mind is telling me to stop saying this. Because it freaks out because it's lost control. You need to stop and think about what you're saying first. That, I'm, just let, I'm trying to be completely open here. So you understand that like I'm, I'm brother trying to speak to family. Not all my pedestal preaching down telling you what you're doing wrong. But try, I'm trying to be as transparent and honest as we can be so that we can get out of the pits that we are in. So what Jesus did was he came down off that cross. Buried for three days or on the third day, whatever, came up out of the, because I don't know how you want to technically do that, right? It was really about 30 hours, 36 hours. But, you know, that doesn't sound like 72. <laughs> so whatever you want to do there. But on the third day, he came up. And when he came up, it was, it was a different body, unrecognizable. Only thing that you could recognize was the, his heart. Mary, <gasps> Raboni, don't cling to me, right? She thought he's the gardener. So she can't recognize him. He's taken a different form. But she hears the heart of the way he said her name. Because remember, he knew her. And he called her by name. And it changed her. So one of the one of those early, for most of y'all, y'all weren't here. And that's not, I'm just saying. When, so I keep going back to the beginning for me, which was 2015, April of 2015. So early sermons of April 2015. I was trying to explain things like, do you know your name? Because when God said my name, my world changed. All of a sudden, like the old Jeff, gone, dead, gone, dead, gone. It was fantastic, right? Scripture says things like, you know, you need to take off the old self and put on the new. The old is dead, the new is come, right? Those kinds of things. Reckon your old self dead to sin but your new self alive in Christ. And yet at the same time, it says when you were dead to your sins, Jesus Christ came and made you alive. And so it's like, wait a second, was I dead or was, did I need to consider myself dead? You know, there's confusion in the scriptures when it comes like that. Why? Because repentance is a really hard concept to grasp. And so the only way to explain it is I was dead and now I'm alive. I need you to hear me very clear. When I was seven years old and I prayed for Jesus to come into my life and I learned how to pray and I got discipled and I began to, you know, I actually started leading my friends to Jesus. And at 15 years old and I rededicated my life and I really started telling people, strangers about Jesus. And at 17, I'm preaching the gospel and then you go into college and then you become a youth minister and all of that stuff. Let me be very clear. I was dead. Until April 7th of 2015, when I saw the Lord, and old Jeff died. And if I don't consider that the truth, then the old self comes back. But every day, when worry and anxiety and stress and circumstances and what people say and what people do and what my boss did and what, whatever you want to pick, whatever happened to my car or whatever... All of that stuff can really speak. But my, this is just Jeff now for a second. My key is that I say every time, I can't allow the thought to leave my mind, is every time that stuff comes in, I say, no, nope, this is who I am. Because we live this thing. And that is so demonic. It is so anti-scripture. Y'all understand that, right? 
John the Baptist said that the one who comes after me is so great that I am not even worthy to lace up his sandals. I don't even know what that means because our sandals are different than theirs, right? Theirs were, you know, ours are like strap or Velcro or slide in or flip flop or something like that, you know, right? Oh, yeah, leather tie or buckle or something like we don't even know what that means. Strap up, whatever. But he said, when, the, when that one comes, he will make the high places low. And the valley will be filled. And the windy road will be made straight. And the rough road will be made smooth. And so I have preached that how many times? How many times has that come up in the last six years? Some of you have been here that long. You know, you've heard me say it a thousand times. Maybe not exactly a thousand, probably like 250 times. But yeah, talk about conviction right there, right? Like, mm, why don't you say a thousand? <laughs> yeah. Yes, Lord. Yeah. God loves us so much that he sent his son. That if we would believe to the point of getting to know him, because it's not enough to believe. Even the devil believes. Right? So it's not enough to believe. That's what James says. Faith without works is not faith. Show a man who says that they have faith, but they don't have works, and I'll show you a person that has faith and works. That's what he says. Like You show me you, and I'll show you me. And we'll decide who has faith. That's actually what the point that he's making in James. It's fantastic. But if all I do, because this is, again, almost like a double speak, right? Like, you have to listen to me. If you know the Lord, you can't help yourself. You are compelled to tell everybody about the Lord. You are compelled to tell people what he's done for you. But if all you do is compel And yet still struggle with sin. Away from me, I never knew you. So it's a double-edged sword. You have to know him, and you have to do what he tells you to do. Not out of slavery, but out of affection. Out of pure gratitude and love. I know I haven't really had us look at a lot of scripture, but you know I've been quoting it, right? I hope you do. It would be really fun if Jesus just showed up today, blew the trumpet, and we all went home and made our lives easier. Do you know how demonic that statement is? Let me explain why that's a demonic thought. Because to think, man, Jesus, I wish you would just come right now, make my life easier, is to say that you regret the breath he just gave you. And that you don't know how to live with the breath of life that he's putting into you. So just take it away and bring me home. Yeah, that's going to be a great day. But you know what today is? Today is a fantastic day because the Holy Spirit is in you and upon you and oozing out whether you want him to or not. Oozing out saying, I need you to love on somebody. And let, get, let me be very clear. Everybody in this room needs some love. We all do. We need a big old hug party, you know. We need a lot of love. Yeah. We need a lot of love. But I can't love you unless I know him. I can only give you brotherly kindness. Or maybe a parent's love I can treat you like a son or a daughter. Show some compassion. I can, I can pat you on your back and say, oh, baby, it'll be okay. 
as if your circumstances are justified. Your, circu- like your, re- your reaction to your circumstances is not justified. You, you've already been justified by the cross. It did the work. You don't have to do anything, and nothing that you do outside of Jesus paid for that, I'm okay. I got the joy. I mean, we sing about joy. We'll read about joy. We'll talk about joy, but we don't experience joy. Man, I just really wish that God would give me some joy right now. It's a choice from a perspective that comes from knowing him. My calling was pastor. I filled the pastor's calling. I knew his voice. I did not know his face. But then I saw his face. Now, did I visit, physically see his face? No. Did not physically see his face. Let me tell you what I saw. Okay. It was through an experience. First, I heard an audible voice that said, Jeff, I'm not asking you anything. And that scared me. Because it filled the room and things fell off the walls in the office. It was like an earthquake, except it was a voice. It wasn't the little small one. It was, I just healed you, how dare you? How dare you deny it? I watched my right leg grow out. I was protesting it. I didn't believe in it. My right leg grew out, and I was like, this isn't real. And then he says, now stand up and touch your toes. And I went, that's not possible. Then I touched my toes. Not only did I touch my toes, but my palms hit the floor. First time that had happened in 15 years. And then he said, now turn left, which meant to do this. And I didn't have the muscles to do that because they had died from 15 years of having a serious injury. And so I could not turn left. And so I laughed and said, God, I don't know why you keep asking me to do impossible things. And he said, Jeff, I'm not asking. And I went, yes, Lord. Tears. I mean, it was scary. I said, yes, Lord. So I pulled right, and then I just, they call it a punch in discus, and I just punched that arm. And when I did, my back went, and I grew, and I got healed, and it's great. And in that moment, I went, oh, my gosh, you are so good. I was in rebellion. I was under law. I thought about love. I talked about love. I preached about love, but I didn't know you. Oh, my gosh, I never knew you. This is who you are because my whole life, for at least the last 15 years of my life, let me even go back. I'm 16 years old. I break my ankle. Then I tear my knee. I have to have knee surgery to replace, you know, the ligaments and all that stuff in my left knee. They have to do bone grafts. They have to do all kinds of stuff to heal my leg because it's eight weeks of decimation. I mean, it was destroyed. And then... And then it was like six months of rehab trying to play a football game and then miss a game because I couldn't walk for eight days after a game because my knee would be so swollen. But I needed to play. And so I'm, you know, I'm out there playing on one leg. The whole time saying, well, God's trying to teach me something. And then, and then a year later, I tear my shoulder and hurt my back and I'm paralyzed in a football game and I can't move. And then it comes back, and I'm like, well, he just doesn't want me to play. Well, I'm going to play anyway. I'm going to go play college ball regardless. So then I went to go play college football, and I tear my ACL, and I'm like, what is going on? So I miss half the season because of my ACL. It's not a complete tear. It's a small tear. It doesn't need surgery. It's healing on its own, but it takes six weeks. It's a 10-week season. Are you kidding me? Three days into the season, my knee is gone, and I have to sit out for six weeks. So guess what? I have no choice but to redshirt. Good enough to play, have to redshirt. Can't play. Miss the whole season. Got to go through practice. They won't even let me play offense anymore because I'm a waste of their time. So I'm having to play defense, but I'm a receiver playing offense, but I'm having to practice defense every day. And then finally, when seven weeks goes by, they come in, and they're like, okay, Get in there with the starters. And I'm like, I don't remember the plays. I haven't seen a playbook in six weeks. And then they go, okay, 
you're not a good student, you're not a good athlete, you're not this. And then all of a sudden, they just started attacking me, and the coaches went after me. And I'm like, God, my dream was to play college football. So I played that for two years. I get four concussions. So I transfer here to run track. But the problem is that I'm academically in a bad place because I've tried suicide multiple times. Like, you want to know why I was attempting suicide? It's because I could not get on the field. It's terrible. I gave up on God. I gave up on everything. I didn't want anything to do with God. This is true testimony right here. So after my fall of 2002, I transferred. I went to Coastal Bend College over here in Alice. I'm going to school, getting some of my basics done because, you know, I got to get my academics back up so that I can come over here and run track in 2004. While I'm doing that, I'm helping my dad with his track team over in Cal Island, and I'm vaulting because I'm trying to walk on to run track here. So I'm practicing. You know what happens? I just one time didn't didn't go for perfection. I just went, this isn't a good jump. I'm going to bail out and be safe. And when I bailed out, my foot got stuck in the pit and broke off, and I had three bones shattered into 32 pieces. They disintegrated. They could not find the bones. I lost all four ligaments, my Achilles tendon, everything gone. The muscle on the top of the foot that wiggles the toes, gone. No. After all of that, I'm still, my dream. Bible says God will give me the desires of my heart. This is my desire. He will do it. And after year after year, 2004, I walk on with a broken foot. And I made the team. Running with all of that damage, still doing it. Doctors saying there was nothing wrong with me. Because I could run, and technically with all that kind of damage, you're not supposed to be able to walk. And finally, one year to the day after the injury, doctor, a specialist finds the problem, calls me at 9.30 at night and says, you need to have emergency surgery tomorrow. And I said, what's the point? I'm in the middle of a season. You take this away from me, and I'm not going to be able to compete ever again. You do this surgery now, it's, it's an it's a end-of-career surgery. They don't know how to fix it. They're just going to repair it and get you going. Give me one season. Please let me have one season. So I continued to compete on a broken leg. June, I had my surgery. I get cleared again. I'm actually allowed by my orthopedic surgeon to go try out to run track again because I'm not on the team anymore, so I have to go back and try out again. But before I do, i got to have another, another physical because of my ankle and the surgery. you got to have another one. But the team doctor who is certified to do it won't do it. Don't know why he wouldn't do it, but he wouldn't do the physical. And he wouldn't let me go to the other doctor that had already done the physical. He made me go to the school doctor. And they did a complete physical, complete physical, and they found that because of the spine injury, my spine had curved, and I had scoliosis, and I was no longer allowed to compete on campus. Removed everything. Kicked me off the team. Told me I was nothing. So my mom, being a great mom, she was like, you know what? Let's just, let's go to Stephen F. Austin and see if you can walk on there. So I go over there, and I meet with the coach, and I have a great day. I have a personal best day. I jump 16 and a half feet. I actually cleared a bungee at 17 foot, and I'm like, this is going to be great. The guy offers me a scholarship on the spot. That was on Friday, and on Monday, I'm over at Cal Allen practicing now because I got to get in shape because I'm not in shape, and my ankle broke again. And at that moment, I said, okay. I love you, God, but this is who you are, and you don't give. You take away, and I'm okay with that because I love you, and I will serve you all my life, but you and me are never going to be on speaking terms. We're always going to have an issue here. I will tell people about how good you are, and I won't tell them how bad you are, but you and I both know you're inconsistent. 
And then in 2015, he healed me. And he showed me that he was always for me. That he didn't do any of those things. And there was no lesson to learn, except that he was really good. He wasn't trying to teach me anything. It changed my life. And from there, I can't help but tell everybody. I see somebody, and I'm like, God, let me tell them. Let me tell them about Jesus. Let me tell them about Jesus. Yesterday, Jacob and I were at Arby's, and there was a guy that looked like he had a stroke. And his left side, his eye was open. You know, the young guy, probably my age or younger, left hand dragging the left leg. And I went, God, let me tell him. And God said, he's not ready for what you would bring. You need to trust me to make good soil. And I went, oh, okay. Jacob even saw it. He's like, what's the Lord telling you? Is he telling you to go? And I'm like, no, he's, he's telling me he's not ready for what I'm going to bring him. Right? Yeah. Because there's a season. There's a time for the healing. Absolutely true. And if he gives you the go ahead, you better go. And if he's saying, hey, you need to go talk to that person. You walk into a restaurant and you see somebody and you think, I should probably talk to them. Don't know what I'm going to say. Uh, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. He says, all he says is, the only instruction biblically for that is open your mouth. I'll fill it. But anyway, that, I'm trying to show you what I saw. Was I saw a God who loves me, never holds anything back from me. He is for me. If I had ever just gotten to know him, I had followed him that whole time. From 16 to 24, I followed him that whole time. But I didn't know him. I went to church. Oh, I, I read my Bible. I preached a few times. Struggled with bipolar disorder, struggled with depression, because the God that I served wasn't good. And I blamed him for my circumstances. And then I saw him face to face. Wow. Why am I saying all of this? Because I'm trying to get you into one small little place. Are you willing to just Go investigate who the Lord is. The way it happened for me is I locked myself in a room and said, God, you promised these things and I never see them. And I'm not okay with that anymore. I'm not leaving here until you show me. And it took three days. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. And on Wednesday... He healed me, and I didn't believe in it, but he healed me, and I'm trying to encourage you to go lock yourself in a place where no one hears you but God, and say, God, let's start with here. Show me who you are. My prayer Every day for the last six years and three, four months has been one basic prayer that starts everything. Today, make me a blank slate and write your truth on my heart. Whatever I learned yesterday, erase. Show me new. It's opposite of what we've been taught, right? Add knowledge. Attain, and, and attain wisdom. Great, grow in these things. But I say, Lord... All I need is you, because you're the spirit of revelation. You're the spirit of wisdom. You're the spirit of knowledge. We were reading about that today. It's from Isaiah 11, verse 2 and 3. We are reading about that in Sunday school. Hopefully, y'all guys start coming to Sunday school at 930. It's fantastic. We got two different classes. It's, it's awesome. We had 18 there this morning. It was great. You just, you'll grow. You'll grow if you go. It'll help. Because we don't have enough time in the day to read, and we definitely don't have enough time in the day to sleep in and miss a Bible study. 
Because then are you going to make it up? Who are you going to do the Bible study with later? Or are you just not going to do the Bible study because God's not your king? He's not the Lord of your life. He's not your everything. He's just your morning after you wake up when you feel like it. You know what I mean? A sharp word, but... Woo. I don't know how to get back to where I want to be. We have such an opportunity. Not UBC. No, I'm not even talking UBC right now. We have such an opportunity right now to be who God created us to be. Everybody in this room individually, you have the opportunity to be free from whatever ever comes. I'm not even talking about the old person anymore. I'm just talking whatever comes your way, you can be free and be like, <sighs> you know. Sometimes people ask me, like, how come you never get upset? Oh, I get upset. I do. How long does it stay, though? It doesn't stay very long. Why? Because I'm special? Mm -mm. How do we all stay happy when crazy things happen? See, we're not supposed to grieve like the world does. We're not supposed to mourn like the world does. We're not supposed to lament like the world does. We're not supposed to get angry. We're not supposed to, because, all right, let's, one last thing here about emotions, right? Emotions are, God gave me my emotions. No, he didn't. Emotions are the result of the fall of man. They're soul. Their emotions are solical. They're not spiritual. No, no emotion is spiritual. None. Look at the fruits of the spirit. Joy is not an emotion. It's an expression of happiness. Happiness is the emotion. Joy is the expression of it. How's that? Any of the other ones emotions? Mm -mm. What? No, I'm talking about the fruits of the spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Any of the spiritual things there, any of those an emotion? No. All right, not even love. So, so which emotion is it? Anger is an emotion. Sadness is an emotion. Bitterness is an emotion. Resentment is an emotion. Jealousy is an emotion. What else we got? Fear. Fear is an emotion. The, yeah, malice, right? Yeah. I never did get to Colossians 3. I was going to tear that up. Next week, right? Yeah. Maybe if you'll let us. Yeah. Okay, this is what we're going to do. Okay, look, God is so good. He wants to know you. And he wants to walk with you in the cool of your day, which is he's the cool of the day. So if he walks with you, it's the cool of the day. It's not hot. It's hot out there, but when Jesus walks with you, it's cool. He, he comes in. You, you might walk in a wilderness, but when God walks with you, it's a garden. Let me, let me be more realistic and more practical here. How many of us have encountered God, and then all of a sudden it was like colors got clearer, brighter, and like your perspective changed, right? Yeah, see, that's what we're talking about. Like you might have been walking in a desert, and all of a sudden it's a garden. Perspective changes. Reality changes. Circumstance change with him. So how do we get there? We don't get there by, oh, everything's going wrong, God. When are you going to show up? That, that's, that's, not, that's not the garden. That's, no, the garden is, God, you're so good. <sighs> there it went. I cast my cares upon you. You're good. Let me just stay here with you. All right, let's go through this together. This is going to be really rough, but you and me together, it's going to be rosy. Let's show me who I'm supposed to love on while we're going through this together. Give me perspective. That is faith. That's relationship with the Lord, which is what faith is. When we turn faith into a belief. So that's the...
There we go. Cool. All right. Trying to be quick here. My goodness. Should take the note from that. Like, land the plane already. God's good and he loves us and it's amazing what he's trying to do in you and he's, it's amazing what he's trying to do in me. I, I spoke sharp and I, and I know that there was a lot in there, but in the back of my mind this whole time, it's been figure out a way to make this joyful and I just couldn't quite figure that out in my own language. It's hard to do. When I read some of these, like if you want to see some stuff, you read like 1 Corinthians or 1 Thessalonians. And it's a lot of rebuke and really dark. But the whole time he's like, I'm giving joy. Like I'm, I'm giving God thanks for you. Literally what he says. But, it's, but then he has to go through all the negatives to get to the positives. So today was a day where we kind of addressed some negative things and, and spoke some sharp things and really made you question your faith so that you will go spend some time with the Lord and realize how amazing he is and how amazing you are so that you'll actually have some gratitude in your life that will compulse you, compel you out into loving everybody that you see and not just, you know, worshiping him in the car. But actually worshiping him when you encounter somebody who's ready to fight you. Can you worship God in that? Like that's one of the things, just so you know, that because God, God's always growing us. One of the things he's working in me right now is learning how to worship no matter what the atmosphere is. He's actually teaching me to worship to like the worst music, like really, really bad lyrics, not anything about God. And he's like, if you can't love, if you can't worship me in that, then you don't know how to worship me because I'm there too. We say that God's everywhere, but we only put him in the religious section and we don't acknowledge him over there in the triple X section, but God's there wanting to break loose. Would you dare worship him there and maybe change the atmosphere? That's what God's training me to do right now. A couple of our, our ladies are being called to like do strip club ministry. And I'm like, "Woo, that's not for me yet, but go for it. It probably will never be for me, by the way. You know, I can't imagine a guy walking in and being, you know, that's just a, that's not a mental image I even want to address. Yeah, but, but the, but the. But it's awesome that ladies are being called to do that, and, uh, and, and I'm all for it, right? We should all be for it. Not afraid to go in there, but bold to go in there with confidence because God's going to change the atmosphere, and everybody in that place will get saved. And if we go in with any expectation other than everybody's going to get saved, when we walk into that bar and that place, then we didn't go in there with God at all. We went in there with an idea that we think is God's because God's for everybody in the room. <laughs> 